Washington having appeared last night on the World Affairs Today cable television show. This morning, unfortunately, we've just come in out of the rain, standing in DuPont Circle next to the memorial of Mahatma Gandhi, who in India is revered as the father of the nation. You know, people ask me, David, why is the seven arts of change process successful every time? And my answer is, I believe it's because the arts themselves are based on fundamental, ethical, universal principles. In an organizational setting, this means treating every individual with dignity and respect. And that includes training, education, and financial literacy. This gives them the tools to succeed. You know, the underlying foundations for change really echo the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, who, remember, drew his inspiration from many spiritual traditions around the world. And it was Mohandas Gandhi who was the source of inspiration behind the vision and action of Dr. Martin Luther King, whose own memorial will soon be dedicated just a few blocks from this location. Consider the notion of the Judeo-Christian golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This means to put yourself in the place of the other person in order to understand their needs first. Understanding needs is critically important at the start of any change process. Amazingly, Confucius actually coined the silver rule, which was a similar principle of reciprocity to put yourself in the place of the other, as recorded in the Confucian Analects. And in the Buddhist tradition, a central doctrine is the notion of anatma, or selflessness, to be selfless, again, is to put yourself in the place of the other person. Let's face it, anywhere in the world, people are positively and effectively led to change when you understand needs first. This is the reason why the first art, the art of preparation, is solely focused on understanding needs. And you know, to underscore the point, just consider the inverse of the same principle. Why is it that people anywhere in the world instinctively and naturally resist the rule of a dictator? We find this today in Egypt, Syria, Yemen, Libya. The underlying principle is that people will resist change if they know that the people leading the change have no interest in understanding their needs, or better yet, understanding the needs of the relationship. When resistance is at work, people understand there's no effort to connect, no effort to build trust between the leaders of change and those expected to execute the change. In the organizational setting, this dictator situation is evidenced by your typical autocratic manager. The manager who yells, who creates fear and intimidation in the workplace, who threatens you with your job. If you don't do this, this will happen. Have you ever been threatened with your job? How did that make you feel? Such a person is not a leader. Such a person somehow feels emboldened that their position and title gives them the force of truth. The real force of truth is what Mahatma Gandhi called Satyagraha. And the cornerstone of this change process is the notion of ahimsa, or nonviolence. Remember, it was ahimsa, nonviolent means of protest, that enabled Dr. King to lead the civil rights movement in this country. It is my hope that the seven arts of change, being based on universal principles, will help you to effectively lead change, whether it's in the business workplace, in education, in government, or perhaps most importantly, in your daily life. Thank you. Dr. David Shainer holds a PhD in comparative philosophy from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and currently serves as Herring Professor of Asian Studies and Philosophy at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. A true Renaissance man, Dr. Shainer is not only a philosopher, but also an Olympic downhill skier, a former law enforcement officer, and a business consultant to Fortune 500 companies around the world. He also holds a seventh degree black belt in the martial art of Ki Aikido and serves as the chief instructor for the Eastern Ki Federation. His extensive publications include The Body-Mind Experience in Japanese Buddhism, Science and Comparative Philosophy, and his most recent work and the subject of today's talk, The Seven Arts of Change, Leading Business Transformation That Lasts. In The Seven Arts, Dr. Shainer brings his knowledge of Japanese philosophy and spirituality to bear on the world of business with outstanding results. For example, his work with Duracell from 1987 to 2000 resulted in a 400% improvement in operational efficiencies, a 650% increase in revenue, and a 2,000% increase in shareholder value. 
and the purchase of the company by Gillette in 1996 for $7.82 billion. He was my mentor in both philosophy and the martial arts while I was at Furman University, and it's my great honor to introduce him today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Shaner. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I got goosebumps watching myself. Uh, that was kind of a strange introduction, but um, uh, that is showing you a video of myself. But I wanted to, to tee that up uh, to let you know that um, I'm actually retiring from Furman University because uh, the, at the end of this term, because I'm so excited about the positive reception of this book. It's the first time I ever tried to write a trade book, you know, the kind people would actually read. Uh, but, you know, you can do it in the afternoon at the beach, so I recommend it. But um, I tell you what, last night I actually decided, you know what, I'm going to give a completely different talk. Um, and what I'm going to do is make it very personal. I know this is being videotaped, uh, so I'll try to uh, mind my manners. But, you know, uh, I feel very much at home. I teach at Furman University. It's a small private liberal arts school just like this. When I look out at the audience, I feel like I'm looking at my students at Furman. Uh, I'm welcomed by my ex-student, uh, now Dr. James McRae, at a wonderful dinner with he and his lovely bride last night, Heather. And I thought, you know what, um, let, let's just get down to earth and talk about the basics here. What happened, why I'm leaving the university, and why I'm so excited in the, the next chapter in my life to promote a kind of uh, parallel structure that people are afraid to talk about. And that is business and spirituality. My experience uh, for over 30 years of consulting in an industry where there's a 70 to 80 percent failure rate, that is when people try to so-called change the culture as a result of a merger, an acquisition, a joint venture, uh, maybe it's a, even a, a bad change like chapter 11, and, and it requires that everyone in the workplace has to make a shift. So no wonder there's a 70 to 80% failure rate. You know why? A corporation is a myth. A corporation is nothing other than, we could call this auditorium a corporation. Uh, and, and do we feel connected? Well, sure we do, we're at this symposium. But actually the corporation is you, right now, thinking to yourself. It's made up of individuals. Do you find in your daily life that change is easy? Do you ever try, how, how many have said, you know, I'm gonna lose weight? Okay, you know, and it's, it's hard. You might have some success, but then keeping those pounds off is hard. How about this? I'm going to exercise more and get fit. Yeah. Um, how about those uh, parents who are thinking, time management, you know, I, I'm just running all over the place, my work, my kids, I'm going crazy. How am I going to manage my time so I can have time for myself? Oh, there's more hands on that one. <laughs> all right. So no wonder if it's hard for an individual to change, then obviously it's hard if you've got a large international corporation and the business need expects people to change on a dime. Because usually those people don't want to change. And you know why? I have another theory. We are all addicted. It's not just people, we use the word addiction like it's something bad, drugs, alcohol, nicotine, something like that. But you know what we're addicted to? The way in which we've always done things. It's our life habit. It's the reason why we find personal change difficult. So in this talk, I thought what I would do, whoops, look at that, I went ahead of myself. In, in this talk, I wanted to get personal and just tell you, let me back up, look at that. whoops. The unlikely story is, you know, this would be like, how unlikely was it that somebody figured out right to put the peanut butter with the chocolate? Which it turned out to be a good thing. Well, I'm, go I'm going to talk about my own story only to make it personal, not to make it sound egotistical in any way. I'm going to say, I want to speak to you students. Say, you know what? You never know what's around the next corner. I will say I never took a business class in my life. In school, I just didn't find it interesting. You know, today I follow two basic principles. Buy low, sell high. Unless you're shorting the market, if you don't do that, you're in trouble. Or how about this, profit is revenue, less cost. You know, you can't hire people. Well, here's the deal. 
Here's, here's the personal part. My roots are in western Pennsylvania. My grandfather worked for U.S. Steel during the Depression. He was a foreman. So working during the Depression is an oxymoron. Uh, he worked one day a month. And because he served in World War I, if it weren't for his friends, the farmers in western Pennsylvania, that would feed essentially my, my uh, father and his sister and their family, you know, they would have starved, as many people were really hurting during the Depression. And right now, those communities in western Pennsylvania that had a lot to do with steel, they're gone. They're ghost towns. When I was born, 33% of the income coming into the U.S. Treasury came from the United States manufacturing. As long as I have been alive, manufacturing jobs have been leaving this country. Today, the, the percentage of revenue coming into the U.S. Treasury as a result of paying taxes is about 8%. So what's my mission? Why am I so excited about the message that I want to share with you? I want to stop the systematic outsourcing of American jobs. Right now, with high unemployment, this economy needs it. And guess what? The key is actually talking about spirituality and religion in the workplace. My track record you know, is such that people say, David, you need to write a book. You need to communicate this. How is it you have a 100% track record leading change in an industry where there's a 70 to 80% failure rate? And I thought to myself, well, I kind of put it off going, you know, I'm not a public person. I'm kind of shy. I kind of keep the consulting to the side. I'm you know, a university professor. But the momentum kept building and building and building. And finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to write this book. And I couldn't be happier with the testimony of my past and current clients that are saying, David, go get it. Because guess what? When we have unemployment, the United States government is doing what? Paying out, right, unemployment. That's costing a lot of money, right? And guess what? They're not taking anything in. You take that same person, employ them, guess what they're doing? They're paying taxes. We have a $16 trillion debt. Right? The United States government takes in $300 billion a month to operate. You know how much we take in with taxes? $180 billion. You know what that means? We borrow $120 billion a month. 41 cents on every dollar we spend, we borrow. This is unsustainable. My idea is put people back to work. And guess what? Large corporations that I consulted to in the early days Basically, I watched the outsourcing of American jobs, and I quit. I was actually a management consultant before I came to uh, Furman uh, University. And I, I said, you know what? This doesn't have integrity. I'm going back to you know, follow my ideals and be a college uh, professor. Uh, well, let me share with you this story, but at least I hope you can feel that my passion is for you as you think about your life, you think about where you're going in the future. You can make a difference, because guess what? Here's my mantra. If I can do it, you can do it. All I have is just a weird kind of a background that I want to share with you so you can see how does all this fit together and why is it that I would be so passionate encouraging you to try to make a difference in the workplace. Let's, let's continue. All right. Do you see anyone that's got good posture there? See the guy in the middle row closest to me, sitting up straight like this? That's me. I'm a, I'm a Midwest guy. That's my father, right? I grew up in Illinois, actually. My father uh, was the one from western Pennsylvania. And I thought to myself, gee, I was already practicing Zen, right, at an early age, with good posture. And then I asked permission. This is my son. You can see he's got great posture. Oops, whoop, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, this isn't Zen Buddhism. Get out of it. Anyway. Okay. Uh, it's a very sensitive switch, yeah. Okay, so I'm from the Midwest. So I grew up thinking, okay, who are your heroes? That's George Hall, Chicago Bears, Vince Lombardi, Green Bay Packers. That's my college uh, high school teammate, Gary Fensick, uh, captain of the Bears defense, 1986, all time leading Chicago Bears tackles and interceptions. So I grew up with this idea, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that's my dad. Can you see the haircut? He was like the Marine drill sergeant. So that's half of my upbringing. You know, you got to work hard. There's no free lunches. You just got to do it. And that, that's very important with what I do in business. I say, look, change is not easy. It's tough. It requires discipline, patience, just like in the martial arts. 
But my thing with ski racing, as Jim kindly said, in ski racing, if you're going down a hill at 90 miles an hour, let me tell you, this idea of being tough, it's a myth. You'll, your, legs will get, your, your legs will get tense, you'll hit a bump, and you'll soar off into space. If you, it's much more like ballet or dancing. If you're not very soft and subtle, going 90 miles an hour, then it's not going to work. So I realized, gee, I need a completely different change of thought. Well, the other part of the background. Here's my mom. My mom was like the theologian in the family. When I was in seventh grade, I can't believe I'm telling these stories. Jim, I don't think you've even heard this stuff. When I was in seventh grade, I was a confirmation dropout in the, in the Methodist church. I went to one session for, you know, you're going to go through summer study in seventh grade. And the idea is, when you're done, the said, you're going to be able to join the church and become an adult member of the church, uh, like in a special uh, Sunday service in September after summer study. And I thought to myself, my parents keep telling me I'm not an adult. You know, I'm 12, right? So this is not an educated decision. It sounded like this is very important. I'm going to become an adult member of a church. But the first thing that hit me, I said, I don't have any other choices. This is my parents' decision. This is how I grew up. So I went home and I told my mom, I can't do this. What if I want to be a Buddhist? And she said, you know what, um, okay. First she thought, clever kid, trying to get out of summer religious study. Um, and then she said, no, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna study. I said, you can opt out of this particular you know, program, but uh, I will work with you, and since you asked, we will study world religions this summer together. So my mother was like my tutor. And here's what I learned as a 12-year-old. First of all, in Buddhism, this is Dogen Kigen. He lived from 1200 to 1253. He's the founder of the Soto Shu, um, brought over from Japan, Chan, excuse me, China, Chan Buddhism. He was the founder of what, in the West, we think of as Zen Buddhism. And the key doctrine is selflessness, to be without self. What does that mean? That means that, you know what you're really empty of? Is an independent existence. You think you're this individual, like I'm David, here's my head, here's my toe, and I'm here. But let me ask you some very quick questions. How long can you live without food? A month, good, thank you, yeah, about 30 days. Okay, good, so that tells me if I'm not taking in stuff from the outside, if I'm not eating, right, a good diet, then this body, this biological phenomenon will cease to exist. So I'm connected to what I eat. It's necessary for my survival. Great. 30 days. How about this? How long can you live without water? Three days. Wow. Unless, I'm, unless my being is taking in water from the outside, I will cease to exist. How about this? How long can you live without air? <laughs> Three minutes. We take for granted that you are already deeply connected to everything around you and to each other. The Buddhists call this Pratyatma the doctrine of dependent origination. All things in this universe are causally connected. Believe it or not, I use this when I'm coaching large, you know, CEOs um, of large companies. I say, every gesture you make, every decision you make, every handshake you make, every email you send, every greeting sends a signal to somebody about what are your true values. When companies try to inspire the corporation and get everyone to lead change, it's like the weekend offsite. And people are sophisticated. You're not going to change a culture in a weekend offsite. And guess what? If your behavior is bright and happy during the offsite, and then they see how you actually treat people all the rest of the time, of course they're going to be skeptical. And of course they're not going to go along with you. So the notion of selflessness, the idea of treating people with dignity and respect, Recognizing that you and the other person are deeply and intimately connected is something you should never forget. But guess what? It's right there in the golden rule, right? What does it mean to do unto others as you would have them do unto you? I have to put myself in the other person's place. So that means the senior leaders of a corporation, if we're going to talk business, which we are, need to sensitively understand where are the people truly coming from and then respect that and leave the people from exactly where they are. How about this? Reciprocity, it was mentioned in the, the video there. Look, Confucius figured it out, and it's pretty interesting that it's called the silver rule. I don't understand this gold, silver, or whatever, but it's the same thing as you can see. Uh, whoops. 
Okay, the Buddha self, I just explained, right? There's no, there's, there's no concrete individual because the recognition is that's a myth. You are, that which sustains you is the degree to which you are connected. The Taoists argue, you know what? That connection, your health and happiness will be dependent on doing that in a very balanced way. Well, being autocratic and saying, do it because I told you so, has never led anyone with any positive enthusiasm ever, and yet it's rampant in corporate America. I have the title, I have the opportunity, I'm gonna tell you what to do. People instinctively resist it, just like they would resist the rule of a dictator. I have no idea why people think that this is an appropriate way to lead people as managers. My Aikido teacher figured this out also, and the way in which you do the martial art of Aikido, if any of you are familiar with it, I'll just say very briefly, is you also, number four, put yourself in the place of the other person. Look, uh, if someone's gonna hit you in the face, the worst place to stand is right there in front of them, right? But if you're gonna hit me in the face, then boom, moving like this means actually now we're both going in the same direction and maybe we can lead together, which is why in the martial art of Aikido, you don't have to use physical strength and force. You do just have to have a very calm mind and see how can I always put myself in the other place or the place of the other person so that we're avoiding conflict and dissension. So if you apply avoiding conflict and dissension in your daily life, then why wouldn't you lead people with love and benevolence, as Confucius would say, or in any other uh, major religious tradition? I got really lucky. I was introduced in the seventh grade for some reason to the study of other religions. And when I was uh, 14 years old, I encountered my teacher, Koichi Tohei, who, re who continued to be my teacher until last year on his passing at the age of 91. He's the person that brought from Japan to America for the first time the martial art of uh, There he is, there's me, there's me again. Uh, this is my latest book, actually. Um, it just came out in Russian, so I'm also responsible for teaching Ki Aikido in Russia, Eastern Europe, and Egypt. Um, and it's my pleasure to share these principles because, you know, at this point I've been doing martial arts all my life. Am I interested in throwing people around? No. Maybe Dr. McRae, yes. <laughs> but but um, the idea is to, to, to share this widely, and so I'm just sh sharing with you that um, the reason why this is not in English actually is because my publisher is waiting um, for the Seven Arts of Change to sell out. So remember during the holiday season, it's a great <laughs> joke, joke. All right, uh, skiing, I'm, I'm gonna go more quickly. Uh, okay, in skiing, I recognized you have to be stronger, relaxed. Chapter four is called The Art of Relaxation. Guess what? Do, 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 do CEOs and do boardrooms uh, you know, scoff at me when I say actually you need your organization to be more relaxed? No, because you know what they understand? There's a thing called distress when a corporation suffers from all kinds of stress and anxiety. And how well do you perform? Ask yourself, when you're under stress, do you perform to the best of your ability? No, ask any athlete. Ski at 90 miles an hour, try to hit a 90 mile an hour baseball. Any, you know, it's all about relaxation so that you can do the very best. Why do we not talk about this in business? If you have an organization that's stressed out, they can't possibly function. And it is when there's no communication, they don't understand the strategy, they're not included in the real business mission, they don't understand the competitors. No wonder they can't perform to the best of their ability. So take a lesson from athletics. I bet you have a favorite professor here at the university. This was Dr. Bill Chalker. He uh, was my professor at a small undergraduate school just like this. And I was probably sitting in an audience at a talk like this, taking my philosophy classes. And what he taught me is that the world of ideas is, a, is extremely powerful. I, you know, people say, what am I gonna do with my philosophy major or English major? My response is, anything you want. If you can write well, present yourself well orally, the world is at your feet. Follow your dreams, follow big ideas, and go out there and make a difference. It's either a hair trigger, ah, University of Hawaii. <coughs> yes, that's me. I said, you know what? I want to apply martial arts. So I said, why not be a policeman? Better yet, do it in Aspen where you can ski. 
This is following your dreams. You can tell by the haircut, it's Aspen. Then, then I said, you know what, I've been there, done that, so I went to Washington, D.C., and I started the Far East Faction. Why was that? My PhD, I finished in 1980. Some of you uh, older folks might remember. That's when America had the quality revolution, and everyone wanted to understand what makes Japan tick. Japan's the size of Montana, and has nearly 50% of the gross national product of the United States of America. And I was reading these books, Theory Z, The Art of Japanese Management, and, and, and these were best-selling books. And I just finished from our alma mater, the University of Hawaii, Japanese philosophy, and I'm reading this and I'm going, these guys really don't understand how the organizations are working in Japan. You know, it reads to me like they went to, for a, a, a two-week tour of a Toyota plant, they learned the term, you know, Toyota production system, and now they're going to be lean gurus, lean manufacturers, write these books, and tell people what to do, and I'm thinking, you have missed the whole people part. So I said, you know what, I'm going to try to make a difference. I'm going to follow my dreams. So I went to Washington, D.C., and I started a newsletter called The Far East Faction. And, and I only did um, uh, three issues, and I recognized, remember my business repertoire, buy low, sell high, profit is revenue, less cost. That was volume one and two. Three. I wasn't sure what to say, but one of the large manufacturing um, consulting companies in the world, the Alexander Proudfoot Company, said, David, we want, we want you to teach us about lean. And, and I said, yeah, but I don't know anything about business, and you're this big, well-known consulting company. <laughs> business is easy, we'll teach you that. So I said, okay. So then I became a business consultant. Uh, in my case, helping them to deliver their consulting services in the Pacific Rim. But they taught me all about just how you go about assisting organizations. Well. What I learned is I sat in those boardrooms as the junior little con consultant, you know, I wasn't supposed to say much because I was just the note taker and I'd sit in the board meeting, but I got to walk into some of the best run companies in the world, and you know what I saw? The outsourcing of American jobs. I said, I can't do this. And that's when I went to Furman. I said, I'm not doing that. So I went to Furman, and then at the very beginning, I had a Fulbright Fellowship, and I went to India. And this particular project was to help Ira Gandhi, then the Prime Minister. Uh, Ronald Reagan was in his first term. I actually took that picture. She, she was very interested in what we were doing. And my job as a comparative philosophy professor with business experience was to go into the rural villages and figure out what do we need to do to make some of the changes that she wanted to affect really stick. Those changes might have included something simple like birth control. But guess what? Unless you understand the needs or the perspective of the people that you're trying to change, it's not going to take. And guess, guess what the idea, how birth control was received in the rural villages in India? You're taking away my retirement plan. Because there's high infant mortality, and the idea of having many children, the way the life stages within the Hindu tradition work, is that that's your retirement, that at some place your kids will end up caring and tending for your needs as an older person. So basically there's going to be considerable resistance. Or what about the use of certain pesticides or fertilizers to increase crop yield? What if just doing those kinds of things in the rural villages was considered something that might generate bad karma? What I learned is that India was just like a corporation. Now, 30 years hence, uh, unfortunately, soon thereafter, uh, I think there was a presentation on this yesterday. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated. But some of the changes that began there by understanding what we have to do in the rural villages to make change take hold began at that time. Then I went to Harvard in uh, 1985 86, um, and Furman held my position. Uh, I taught there, and while I was there in the Enching Library, uh, which is the largest collection of non-Western materials anywhere outside Asia, it's actually right next to the Museum, uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology, and instead of spending a lot of time with Masatoshi Nagatomi going through Buddhist texts, I actually befriended Edward O. Wilson, the father of sociobiology, and Stephen Jay Gould. I became good friends with both of them. I actually got Steve's baseball tickets to the Red Sox. Um, Steve is now uh, passed away, but for those of you that are fans of biology or study sociobiology, the whole idea is to understand the biological basis of behavior. 
That's what leads me to make the claim we are all addicted to the way in which we've always done things. So suddenly there's the athletics part, there's the biological part, I have a book series with the State University of New York Press with 37 volumes, all from, different, all from different aspects of helping us to understand what is the biological basis of behavior and what can we do when we have an initiative that says, I want to positively embrace change to better my life, to follow your dreams. So all of this is embedded in this process. And then, like, wow, you know what this is? This is just about being the best you can be. Well, being the best you can be. And so I, I took it on the road. I believe that I had learned some things from martial arts, from uh, athletics, ski racing, that you're stronger, relaxed. Uh, I, I understood something about the biological basis of behavior. And again, to put this in the context, I'm just sharing with you very personally a life story because all of this just kind of accidentally came together. The only thing that is the glue is follow your dreams. Follow big ideas and follow your dreams. So what happened then? Whoops. I had a student at Furman University. His name was Tony Stevenson. Tony has been singing at the Metropolitan Opera House now for over 20 years. He's one of the world's greatest tenors. He was just, he was a voice major at Furman University and actually was kind of a mediocre uh, singer. And then he started studying these principles, relaxation, breathing, meditation. His voice completely changed. He won a regional competition. Then he won a national competition at the Met. He was rewarded with a young artist contract. And all he was doing was following these principles that you're stronger relaxed peak performance. He was following his dreams. He was able to relax himself completely in order to allow that voice to extend to the back of the auditorium. Uh, another one, whoops, uh, y'all know this guy. Uh, same thing in my days at Aspen uh, through uh, working with Tom Crum, another Aikidoist. Uh, John Denver also trying to take his game to the next level. Kuro Sagawa, a, a world champion sumo wrestler. Uh, my own two students um, from uh, South Carolina became the first international Taigi uh, competition. You were there for that one, right? Um, so anyway, that's Eric Carroll and actually my wife, Ileana Shainer. She can beat me up. Uh, then, uh, uh, actually, this was uh, earlier, taking it on the road. This is George Allen, Hall of Fame football coach. It's all, it's all the same, whether you're working with athletics, uh, there's George. Uh, I, I learned many lessons working in the National Football League on what you have to do to understand the competition. You know what? Uh, who's the big uh, rival of the Washington Redskins? Dallas Cowboys. So when he took the, the job, you know what he did? He said, I need 11 players that are going to be world class and the best of what they do on offense and 11 players on defense. And the goal, in his case, is to win the Super Bowl. Well, the way the rules work in the NFL, if you don't win your division, you're not, you're not doing anything. That's it. So he put together an entire roster with one mission, beat the Dallas Cowboys. And there were some problems. The Dallas Cowboys were rather innovative. They were, they were famous for doing things like hiring the fastest man in the world, Bob Hayes, and say, you know what, you're, you're a gold medalist sprinter. Look, we're going to set you up wide, and we're going to say, you go long. <laughs> drop back and throw it as fast as I can and just challenge anyone in the world. All they had to do was teach him how to catch a football. Well, that meant that uh, on the first day, he had a free safety whose last name was Stone from Vanderbilt, and unfortunately, Mr. Stone got fired right away because his speed just was not enough to be the free safety in the subject of last defense if you're going to beat the other team. I take this philosophy to energize my corporate clients to say, you know what? Understanding the competition should not just be in the marketing department and R&D. Everyone in the company, if you're going to operate to the best of your ability, needs that boardroom awareness. Who is the competition? Who's trying to take my job? And in international business today, as I work to stop the outsourcing, that means if you want to what I call secure your future, if you want this job to stay, if you want the board to give you a shot at saving this job, this plant, in this community, this whole um, town, let's say, if you, you might be a manufacturing plant and the largest employer in your town, well, guess what? You need to understand the competition as well as going to the Super Bowl and understanding the game plan and what are you trying to do against every single other player in the field. When I worked with Duracell, that was Energizer right here in San Francisco. 
And you know what? Remember when they put the testers on the battery packs? Okay, well, that was a race to the finish line, first to market. And then, let's take it to the next level. Now we're going to put those testers on every single battery. Tremendously difficult technology, but the way in which to motivate everyone to secure their future and win and be number one in the world of what we do. And guess what? As long as everyone's a shareholder and they're going to gain in their pocketbook, you know, that's why people come to work for a paycheck. So why not include them in the process? Whoa, whoa, man. on fire. Ah! Anyway, so, ah! This is uh, Ambassador Kato from Japan. We've kind of taken it to the next level in terms of bridging uh, opportunities uh, east and west with this kind of thinking. This is uh, the Emperor Akihito, His Majesty, uh, the Emperor of Japan, uh, which led to suddenly the governor of South Carolina, remember Furman University is in South Carolina, I came back from Harvard and I said, uh, Governor Riley, I'd like to help. You'd like to help do what? I'd like to help retain jobs in South Carolina. Um, governor Riley went to Furman University. He went on to be the Secretary of Education for all eight years, both terms of uh, President Clinton's uh, term as president. And he basically said, David, I hear you, and we started uh, a concerted effort working with the Economic Development Group in Columbia at the Capitol to say what can we do to recruit international businesses to come here in South Carolina and employ South Carolinians. And we did. The first one was Umbro, the soccer company, Slazager, Ryobi, Duracell, Gillette, Owens Corning, Vic, Caesars Palace, Gray Group, Gray Advertising, Mirage Casino and Resort Hotels, Mita Kusira, Nissan Bosch, Frito-Lay, Wellspring, and right now, uh, JW Aluminum, uh, based in Charleston, South Carolina. Perfect. I want to spend the rest of my time simply talking about six questions. If I were to boil it down, Right? Instead of just talking about my story, and again, the reason why I did is I want you to write your own story. I want you to say, you know what? What I do is significant. I should study whatever is really driving my heart and my passion, and I'm going to go out there and make a difference because the world needs me. The bottom line in, the, um, in this Seven Arts book is I wrote a foreword, and in it I addressed six simple questions. That if you can answer these questions, I, I think it can dramatically affect your personal life, for you affecting change in your own personal life, and as you graduate and you go on and you become an employee, please try to affect positive change in your surroundings. Hello? Oh, there we go. The first of the six questions is where? Maybe it's the most important. I think, the reason why they fail, why, why you might fail in a personal change initiative, or in, and definitely why corporations would fail, and there would be a 70 to 80% failure rate when companies try to so-called change the culture, is they don't, do not know where the culture is. If you don't know where something is, how can you move it or change it or edit it or modify it? When I walk into the office of a new company, and I'm sitting down next to he or she, the CEO, I might ask, where's your culture? Is it in your brands? Is it in your IT? Is it in your R&D? Is it in your steady stream of new products that you've developed that are ready to launch whenever you like? And of course, they say, that's not it. What do you think the answer is? Where is the culture? Yeah, they'll say, it's in our people, in our employees. And that is not nearly good enough. Where in the employee is it? Their elbow, their hair, their clothing? Yes, their thoughts. And this is where people, I guess in business, when it comes to ethics and spirituality, they don't want to go to the one place you need to go. The culture is in the mind. And what is the mind? The mind is the collective experience of every employee, every supplier, every customer. 
It's the mindset, it's the collective consciousness. You know this, read Jung, read Hegel, and they'll, talk, they'll tell you, you know, it's the mind. Read the Yogacara system in, in Buddhism, or any school of idealism. Reality is in the mind. If your mind does not change, you will not be successful affecting personal behavioral change. You have to change your thought process first. And people say, Dave, are you trying to brainwash me? And when I first heard that, I thought, oh, you know, brainwash, that sounds negative. But then I thought of it a second, I said, absolutely. I'm exactly doing that. You know, I live in South Carolina. If I say textiles in America, what's happened to it? It's gone. It's outsourced. There's very few anybody doing textiles in the United States. But guess what? One of our clients, I didn't put it up there, was Synthetic Industries. We not only turned that company around successfully, but guess what? who's the most famous investor you've ever heard of? Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. Can you imagine Berkshire Hathaway buying a textile company in the United States where all the employees were already shareholders? That's exactly what we did because he owned Shaw Industries, the world's largest carpet manufacturer. Synthetic Industries was a, was a supplier. They wanted to vertically integrate and bought the whole company rather than sending all those jobs, which was the plan of the private equity company originally, to send those jobs to Honduras. The culture is in people's heads. And if you are involved in any change process for yourself, it's like going to the mall. If you're going to a new mall and you walk in the door, you're going to see what? A map. And on the map, it's going to say what? You are here. And that's what's going to drive your ability to locate wherever you want to go. If you don't know where you are vis-a-vis -vis the map, you're lost. So what we do at the front end of a change process is understand where are people really. That's what I meant in that video talking about understanding needs first. If you want to lead any group whatsoever, then guess what? You need to understand their mind, and I do not believe in surveys. Surveys sounds very scientific, you know, so pardon me if there's some statistical survey people out there, but when you're talking about human nature, you need to go listen. It's called validating somebody's perspective by putting yourself in the place of the other person. It's called the golden rule. It's called the silver rule. It's called selflessness. It's called treating people with dignity and respect. And if you can give them a noble cause, like saving jobs in America, then guess what? Give them the tools to succeed. That includes financial literacy. So my clients spend a, a whole bunch of time not only teaching the financials, if it's private equity, it's EBITDA, earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. If it's a publicly traded company, we teach them how to read the financials. But then every single quarter, the CEO, him or herself, goes to every single location and personally gives the numbers. And guess what? You know why people care? Because we also create programs where they are incentivized based on their performance. Either make them a shareholder if it's a publicly traded company, or have some form of gain sharing with achievable goals that give people the energy and the drive to succeed. Because guess what? In people's heads, why do people go to work? Yeah, look, if we were all independently wealthy, we'd be free to choose our hobbies. So you just look at the pay. The reason why people go to work is they need to. Folks, you're, and I'm speaking to the youth now, the average life expectancy is 27,500 days. Do not take a day for granted. It is so sad when people wake up one day and they find that they've been working in their job for 20 years and they never really liked it, but they were encouraged somehow to go into it for some external reason. You only have so much life, so, such time and that's why the Buddhists would argue, it's called Nikon Noima, focus on the right now. Focus on the right now. That's what's going to affect your thinking, because if you put it off to the next day, the next, and the next, you'll never get there. Whose culture is it? If you're involved in an organization and people don't care, they don't want to be a part of the process, they feel alienated, you know, I tell my clients the culture changes not in the boardroom, 
but in the break room. People have to own the process, and the only way they're going to do that is, once again, treat them with dignity and respect and make them a full participant in what you're trying to do. You know, I'm looking out at you right now, and I'm seeing heads go like this. And every time I take this, this message anywhere, the heads go like this. I'm not telling you anything you do not already know. It's like somebody wrote that book, uh, Help Me Out, something about what I learned in kindergarten. Right? And all the lessons were on the, the back jacket sheet. You know, and that was it. You know? um, I tell people, uh, I, my next book's going to be a diet book. And it's going to be like that kindergarten book. It's, it's four words. That's the whole book. Eat less, exercise more. <laughs> you know that's true. So <laughs> You go into Barnes and Noble, you know, and the largest section is the diet section. And I'm thinking to myself, I got this one solved. <laughs> you know? I, what I'm trying to do is just say, could we just hold the mirror up to ourselves, really? And look at human behavior, look at peak performance, model those who are the best in the world at what they do, and say, you know what? There's a better way to man, there's a better way to lead, to engage people. And you know what else? Here's the biggie, since we're talking about ethics and spirituality and world religions and how that might impact all this. Guess what? If you've got 27,500 days, you're going to spend half of your waking hours in your adult life at work. If you're miserable at work, what a waste. And when people alienate the workforce, of course they're not happy. You know, it's pretty sad when you say, thank God it's Friday. That means you just took, you know, uh, six-sevenths of, of your life, said, I'm going to be miserable except on Fridays. The good news is with this message, friends, is when you treat people with dignity and respect and create the kind of seven arts culture that we have done again and again and again and proved it out for 30 years, guess what? All the numbers take care of themselves. I never had a website. I never had a sales department. The only reason why every one of those companies line up is referral. One happy executive, you know, leads a company and they go to the next and they call me up and say, David, can you help me with this one? I said, I don't know. And so I have a whole process of going through of assessing an organization's readiness for this kind of change. And I have to set up the board and the shareholders on what it's really going to take. Because it's not just hire this change management guy, it's all the education that's going to be required. Uh, by the way, I knew I was going to be heading up. I'm only in five more minutes. Uh, I'd, I'd love to be able to take uh, questions. I think what I'm going to do in the one-on-one -on -one session is actually give you a case study. So if anyone's really interested in how does this actually work, then I'm prepared to give you uh, an answer with the current uh, client. When can you change the culture? This is easy. There are three options with, with respect to time. Past, present, and future. Two of the three, by the way, don't exist. The past is, you know, can you go there? You know, if I ask you philosophers an ontological question. Is the past real? What is the status, the being or existence of the past? Can you go to the past? No. The past is in your present memory. It's why people who have had traumatic experiences in their life, maybe some kind of a abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse. Why does it haunt people their whole life and affect such, such difficulty? Because it's, it's, it remains in their memory affecting their present thoughts and ideals, which is why trying to help such a person has to be very laser-like focused on the now. Yes, it happened, and what are we going to do about it? The future also doesn't exist. The future is nothing other than your present hopes, dreams, and ambitions. That's it. You have to take one little step every single day. So when I ask people about behavioral change, the only way it's going to happen is now. I had one CEO, he said, David, we're, we're in a bind. We need to change like yesterday. I said, no problem. I said, really? No problem? I said, yeah. We can change the whole culture tomorrow. But, but there's only one way to do it, and it's painful. He said, I'm ready. Give it to me. Fire everybody. 
because the collective present mind that, that the way in which we've always done things at this organization will walk out the door, you hire no people, and the biggest resistance to change is their perception of how we've always done things around here. You fire everyone and you just walked out the door. Now, of course, you don't do that because you lose everything. First of all, I wouldn't say it for ethical reasons. But all of your brain power, your experience and knowledge walks out the door. But the point is the same. <coughs> the only effective time for any change initiative to occur is right now. If the culture is in your mind, can you see my mind? No. How do you know I have it? You say, oh, because I can see your behavior, right? And we do this all the time in daily life. I jump for joy. I shake when I'm nervous. I blush when I'm embarrassed. This is how we manage ourselves in daily life. I can't see your mind either, but I can, I can see by your behavior what, what you're actually thinking and doing. So what we measure in a corporation is people's behavior since you can't measure the mind. But mind leads body. It's a basic principle in Ikea. Mind leads body. Mind is the driver of all change, and if you're successful, obviously behaviors will change, which then will generate any positive number if you want to measure that kind of stuff in business, and it works every single time. Finally, what gets the ball rolling, or almost finally? Knowledge. You have to take a tremendous investment in giving people the tools to succeed. That, and I said it already, competitors, financials, up-to-date, real information that should not just be held in marketing or the boardroom. Everyone needs it every single day. There's no reason to not have total financial transparency unless you're breaking the law. And I insist my companies, my clients don't break the law. So I'm going, what is there to hide? They said, what if the competition gets a hold of this? Who cares? We're going to change so much faster than them, we'll leave them in the dust. I don't care, do you? They were like, no, I guess not. Because if it's going to inhibit us from making a change, you're going to just be stuck in the same rut you are. Finally, why do people change? Benefits. We hear a lot today about Wall Street, about private equity, about uh, senior people in the business world getting these unbelievable pay packages. I'm thinking it's out of whack. Look, it's only greed. So I, I go to my clients and I say, look, Let's share the wealth here. Why are you getting so much and everyone else is getting so little? That's not ethical. If you want to bring people in, look, if you want people, very simple, last point. If you want people to think and act like an owner, I got this figured out, another basic, like eat less, exercise more. I got it. Let's make them an owner. That's it. And suddenly now when they're truly brought in, again, given the tools to succeed, treated with dignity and respect, given a noble cause, and you speak the truth, people will care and follow you every single day. Thank you very much.